Dear sisters and brothers in Christ Jesus, this is a homily for the 10th Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year B, and we reflect upon the Gospel passage from St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 20 to 35. Become God's family by doing God's will. That's the main theme of today's scripture readings. This passage from St. Mark is called a sandwich passage by Bible scholars, where one incident or story is inserted in between the beginning and end of another story. And in St. Mark, we find a few of them. The main story here is about the family of Jesus who come to meet him, including his mother Mary. The first part of this story speaks about what the family members think about Jesus. And in the last part we see what Jesus thinks about his true family. Then in between we see the conflict between Jesus and the scribes. So I would say the common theme in today's reading is the invitation to become part of God's family. And we are given an indication as to who will make it and who will not make it to that family. Firstly, St. Mark shows us that two types of people who thought they belonged to God's family actually do not belong to it. Who are they? Let's come to the Gospel passage itself, which begins with his family coming to Jesus. They come to take him home because they thought he was out of his mind. Because a young man of 30 or 32 years old, unmarried, wandering in the countryside, teaching God as father and not as a judge, casting out demons, performing miracles, etc. And without engaging in the family business of Joseph, was unthinkable in a decent Jewish family. And what is more, he was not taking care of himself. He was so immersed in such things that he did not get time even to rest or to eat. He was indeed a misfit for their Jewish family. But still, they considered him one of them. Because for the Jews, belonging to a family or tribe was determined by their lineage, ancestry, blood relationship. And their destiny was determined by this. But the irony that Jesus wanted to show them was that though they all biologically belonged to the same family. They were not part of the family of Jesus, the family of God, the family of the kingdom, according to the standards that Jesus presents at the end of the passage. The Jews, including the family members of Jesus, had taken pride that they were descendants of Abraham, and they were fully confident that that was enough to belong to God and to obtain his favor. What they failed to understand was that God's favor was not something that would automatically come to them since they were part of the chosen people. Remember how John the Baptist reprimanded the Jews. Do not presume to tell yourself we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to form from these stones children to Abraham. Matthew 3.9 Jesus himself reproaches them, saying that they claim to be children of Abraham, but they do not do the works of Abraham. John 8.39 And we know what Abraham did, a total trust and faith in God. And this is what Jesus himself demands as a requirement to be part of his family. He says, who are my mother and my brethren? Whoever does the will of God is my father, and sister and mother. So biological belongingness is no more the criterion to belong to God's family, but doing God's will. A lot of times, even we have this misconception that we are close enough to Jesus. We are baptized, we go to church, say our prayers, we contribute our share to the parish, etc. And hence, we are members of his kingdom. But Jesus makes it clear, nothing 
including our church membership, can automatically make us a member of the family of God's kingdom. But we must be willing to do His will. And there was indeed a bigger family than the biological one with Jesus. We see the beginning of it in Mark's Gospel with the call of the first disciples in chapter 1 and 2. It continues till the call of the twelve in chapter 3. And now it includes all those who listen to his word and do the will of God. But what about Mary? Did not Jesus discredit her role in this passage? St. Luke tells us that Mary was the first to accept God's will totally with her fiat when she said, let it be done to me according to your word. She is therefore the very embodiment of the kind of discipleship that Jesus describes in Mark's gospel and hence truly belonging to his family. So those who use this passage to dishonor Mary even to prove that Jesus had other sisters and brothers, is terribly missing the point. Of course, this is not the place to talk about such nonsensical beliefs and interpretations of our misguided brethren, who are totally ignorant of the Bible and biblical background. Let's come back to the scripture. Look at the first reading. Adam and Eve were part of God's family walking together, talking together, and so on. But the moment they disobeyed his will, they were separated from his family. So they hid themselves. And God comes and looks for him with the question, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Did God actually want to find out where Adam was hiding? He knew it, of course. So this question meant something else. Let's see, if a mother does not see her son back at home in the evening, she may call him and ask, Son, where are you? What does it mean? More than an eagerness to find out the son's location, she is reminding the son, Son, where are you supposed to be now? And where are you? So God wanted Adam to reflect upon where he was supposed to be. You were supposed to be with me now, but what happened? Or you are supposed to be part of God's family, but where are you? As yes, only by doing my will, you become part of my family. Since you decided to do your will, you are not part of my family any longer. There comes sin, separation from God's love and God's family. And this is a good news for us because firstly, you don't have to have special connections, special relations in order to belong to God's family, to his kingdom. And secondly, even if you happen to stray, there is a possibility to return to him, to his family. Because as a responsorial psalm beautifully says, with the Lord, there is mercy in him, his plentiful redemption. Then there is the second group of people whom Mark has sandwiched within the family story, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem. They were people who were well versed in the sacred scriptures and traditions. And when Mark says they came from Jerusalem, it means possibly these experts came at the special request of the local leaders as they were unable to handle Jesus. That means they were highly respected and learned people with some authority. But strangely, these religious scholars thought Jesus was even possessed. And he even colluded with Belzebul, the big one of them. So they proved that being religious or spiritual expert does not mean we know God or that we are in the family of God. Even without deep conviction of prayer and apparent knowledge of the scripture, can still fail to see Jesus for who he is. But here again, the good news is that to belong to God, not even any expertise is required. For Jesus himself said, I thank you, Father, 
for hiding these things from the learned and the wise but revealing it to mere children Matthew 11:25 Yes the kingdom of God the family of God is open to all So after showing us who do not belong to the family of God said Mark tells us who belongs to it anyone literally anyone who is willing to do his will the will of the father you and i can be part of it it's our choice if we are people who constantly seek god's will and nothing but god's will we belong to god's family now during the discussion between the jews and jesus jesus accuses them of the unforgivable sin against the holy spirit what is it let's see the context itself the actions of jesus especially about healing and exorcisms casting out demons were beyond the understanding of the scribes the pharisees and the leaders but instead of trying to understand jesus which would surely have meant their change of heart and lifestyle they accused jesus of being possessed by the devil Firstly Jesus rebuts the accusation simply by appealing to common sense. Any kingdom or household that's internally divided is bound to fall. Therefore their argument has no validity. And then comes his teaching about the sin against the Holy Spirit. The sin against the Holy Spirit is nothing but refusal to open yourself up to God's works, to the work of the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament many a times speak about the Israel people as stiff-necked people because of their resistance to follow God and change their lives. For example, Exodus 32:9, Exodus 33:3, Jeremiah 17:23, etc. While the ordinary people were willing to open their hearts to Jesus, these people continued in their stubbornness of heart. and rejected Jesus and thus closed the door of salvation for themselves so the sin against holy spirit means a deliberate refusal to believe in Jesus and his mercy as the catechism of the catholic church teaches there is no limit to the mercy of god but anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting rejects the forgiveness of his sins and the salvation offered by the holy spirit paragraph 1864 and this is a sin against the holy spirit indeed god cannot forcefully save anyone we need to open ourselves up to him so dear sisters and brothers there are two comforting messages for us today firstly belonging to the family of god of jesus is open to all and it does not depend on who or what we are and we can regain it through repentance if we happen to lose it through sin secondly satan the strong one indeed was bound and defeated by jesus the stronger one hence we can and do fight and conquer him and plunder his house and destroy his kingdom without fear may the lord bless all of us amen